This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you all for joining us today. With me is Richard Fields in the middle and John Cameron down at the other end. Gentlemen, Tr Trump is eventually, apparently, going to sign this relief bill that's loaded with all kinds of nonsense. My favorite he, he, one. He, no, he, he signed it last night. He signed it. He, he signed actually it. signed it last night. I didn't see. Maybe I went to bed early. But no, what, I didn't go to bed early. I was doing something last night, so I didn't actually catch that. Great. Well, he signed it, but I'm not sure if that's a good news. It's good news for the unemployed, I suppose. They get some unemployment benefits, but it's for the rest of it. It's, it's bad news for everybody. I mean, if you get the $900, it's going to cost you $2,700. Uh, and uh, if you're making over, I think, a $75,000 a year, you get Jack. So it's just bad news for everybody. Yeah, and there's so much unrelated stuff. They've got now it's a federal crime to stream pirate movies, apparently. There's all kinds yeah. of goofy. Yeah, there's all kinds of goofy things that they put in. Lots, the of, lots of money for gender studies in Pakistan. I mean, it's, it's just so a, I, a congressional grab bag that it makes no sense on any level whatsoever, particularly since the government has no money. Everything they're uh, spending on this so-called stimulus is borrowed, and it's borrowed from the Fed, who creates it, uh, ready to ready to use without actually having ever having been earned. Uh, it's it's a, it's a recipe for future inflation that uh, is an absolute certainty at this point. Certainly, there's going to be inflation for sure in the stock and bond market, which will simply increase the divide between rich and poor, and Later on, there will probably be inflation in consumer prices, which will again hurt the poor, uh, as you know, in comparison to the to the wealthy. Well, I, I normally hate to agree with Richard. No, we agree on a lot of things, and and um, I I call this thing the scamulus um, rather than the stimulus. I like to come up with. I amuse myself by coming up with other names for things. And and really the the idea that 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 government can fix things by creating uh, uh, money out of thin air, and the only thing that really does is uh, add to the debt bird burden of future generations and and make our, our our fiat currency even more worthless is is crazy. And then the 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 fact that that you know there used to be a difference. Or at least a, a stated difference between the Republicans and the Blamecrats on, on on the fiscal side, but maybe that's disappeared with Goldwater. I don't know uh, where it's disappeared. Yeah, it's it's dis well it disappeared after Goldwater, and it's and it's uh, and it's been totally a uh, 180 degree reverse with Trump. I mean, Trump was you know when he was having his little snit fit, saying he wouldn't sign it, he was calling for two thousand dollars. Uh, going directly to uh, everybody well, with, I, I think, I, 600 I, I, kids. I think the logic of that has, there. there is a tiny... There's no logic. Spark, well, there's, bear with me for 30, 45 seconds. Would you rather take this money that they're creating out of thin air and put it in the hands of the deep state or any state and have them spend it as they see fit or or put it in the hands of the consumers who are going to have to pay the bill anyway and have them spend it as they take your choice it. you get poor by having price uh, consumer price go up really really quickly or you get relatively poor by having stock prices go up and you don't have any stocks that's mm -hmm. the choice yeah well, well the real reason comes to mind. well the real reason the stimulus bill is as complicated and convoluted as it is because all that campaign cash has to get all that campaign cash has to get paid back somehow Yes. And I think that's yeah. what the real reason all that junk, the real reason there's the what the entertainment industry gets a gets a favor thrown in there for no reason. It's why we can't get a clean bill. And it's because people pay so we don't get a clean bills. So moving on, <laughs> New Mexico has abolished asset for asset civil asset asset forfeiture. I can speak this morning. I really can. Five years ago, everybody predicted crime would soar, but it didn't. So we actually have a working case here where asset, this asset, civil asset forfeiture does not work. Man, I cannot say that today. <laughs> well, it, it, civil asset forfeiture is simply a way for police departments and municipalities and whoever runs a police department to enrich themselves uh, at the, you know without ever having to prove 
guilt on people who shouldn't have to be proved guilty anyway, namely people who use uh, so-called illegal substances. Uh, you know, the, the whole idea that uh, the government can determine what kind of medicine you can take and steal all your stuff if you take the wrong kind of medicine is absurd on, on its face. That said, uh, as far as a reducing the so-called crime of drug use, doesn't do it. That's what the uh, statistical empirical evidence uh, compiled by the uh, uh, IJ, the Institute for Justice, has proven without any question. They compared New Mexico with uh, some surrounding states, including Texas, and found that, that there is no statistical difference between uh, New Mexico, which quit asset forfeiture, and Texas, and I think it was I don't know, Oklahoma or someplace where they did the where they did you know they, the asset forfeitures going still going hot and heavy. Well, an asset for, I don't know, do, Richard, do you remember or um, do you know or James, do you know? Because I don't remember when asset forfeiture actually uh, assumed a legal mantle because uh, it used to be that when when uh, cops uh, took money from your pocket and put it in their own, it was called theft and they got written up and fired for it. And now it's a, it's a formal process. When did it become formal? When did, when was, uh, do you remember the court case? I don't know. Uh, obviously, it, it, it became a thing after the drug war became a thing, which was Nixon era. Uh, Nixon famously, uh, or Haldeman, uh, his, uh, his uh, right-hand man, all, uh, famously said that the reason we are conducting a drug war is because we're going after the blacks by uh, it making uh, drugs illegal, and, and uh, this is an easy way to do it. Uh, and, you know, the rest is history. Well, remember yeah. the excuses. It goes back to even back to as far as prohibition and and at the fighting the mob. It's it's all about it's you know they're going after the kingpins. We're not going to care about the little guy. We don't care about the little guy. We're just going to go after the mobs. But of course, those guys have money and lawyers. It's the poor people don't. So they go after the end up going after the poor, and then they wonder why the community has such a distrust of police. This whole things are tied together, and no one wants to think about the more complex issues. Uh, on a happier note, we're looking at a uh, really quite uh, optimistic future when it comes to drugs that are now illegal, including uh, hallucinogens, psilocybin and LSD and other drugs that do have, uh, contrary to what uh, the federal government says, do have medical uses are being legalized at the state level and, and in some cases with some pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, demonstrable positive benefits for people who have uh, mental uh, problems that have not been able to be addressed with uh, traditional medicine. Mm. Well, and then on on top of that, uh, the 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 pot legalization, uh, even though the states have, have again tried to screw it up by taxing it out of existence. I think, uh, and especially here in California, where they put some pretty exorbitant barriers to people going into a pot store and using it. There's there's all sorts of people out there using CBD. Um, and, and apparently, you know, CBD with a tiny little bit of THC in it. For some reason, the receptors, the THC opens up the receptors so that CBD works better for joint pain and all the rest of that. And, and uh, you know, I haven't seen, unfortunately, um, you know, because, because the, the pot is still uh, uh, illegal at the federal level, um, you, you can't really get uh, good studies out there. Um, because the only place you can go to get the stuff legally at the federal level is but this one farm where they turn on a crap 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 product, which I can't say today, James. Um, so it the you know the idea again, Richard stated very very clearly the idea that you make some medicine legal and other other medicine illegal. And, you know one of the things that 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 we have such a huge regulatory state the the Food and Drug Administration and uh, others uh, regulate everything that's even remotely uh, tangential to being a medicine or a food or anything else. And what's ever in their favor, for some reason, uh, uh, gets a free ride. And what, what they don't like, like vaping, they don't like vaping. And, and uh, uh, you know, they put huge barriers to it. You know, in national health in, in England is very, very pleased about the reduction in emphysema and lung disease and all the rest of that they're seeing are promoting vaping and the number of people that are, that are cutting down on smoking. So, the, you know, it's everybody's got a dog in a fight. And, you know, the more things that are illegal, uh, 
And the more laws that are on the books, the, the more courts you need, the more cops you need, the more prisons you need. And, and you know, like the, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm starting to ramble, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. The, the um, as Richard pointed out, the, the intended consequence for this whole thing was stated pr pretty, pretty clearly in the 60s. And, and it's not talked about, which is to take one class of people, one demographic segment, and make their lives miserable and fill the prisons with them. And, uh, you know, that's led to all sorts of horrible, horrible downstream results. So, bad. Legalize it all. Let people make, make uh, you know, make, uh, make good choices. Yeah. Well, talking about legalizing things and making good choices, the... California runs out of reasons and excuses, essentially, for the lockdowns to continue because despite the lockdowns, the California is now the leading epicenter of the coronavirus cases. We've mm -hmm. done the lockdowns. We've done the masking for months, and yet the surge comes. And when, as we think we talked about a few weeks ago, when the judge asked for the evidence, these lockdowns, well, I think he specifically asked for outdoor dining. Why would outdoor dining be banned? They didn't come with any. They didn't have any any scientific evidence that the lockdowns work. Well, and they had they admitted flat out that uh, that uh, the reason they put outdoor dining on the list was to keep people from in their homes instead of traveling. The, the, the numbers out of New York say 1.6% of their cases were traced to dining in general. Um, and that, I don't think they even, there was, I think that was indoor dining. Um, so the, the, there was no, there was no reason specifically for outdoor dining to be banned. It was simply, they wanted people to have fewer places to go. And so if you have four, fewer places to go outside dining, what you're going to do is have people over to your house inside. Uh, they're going to have, you know, lots of chips and salsa and tequila and beer and watch the football game without masks on, chest bump and high five and all that good stuff you do when you're watching either the the, uh, the Lakers or the Dodgers win something because L.A. is the epicenter for this thing. And if you take away a, a, a perfectly healthy uh, outside uh, option, outside dining, not only do you kill off a whole bunch of restaurants and a whole bunch of jobs, but you force people inside where the chances of transmitting the virus are much higher. So, you know, it's it's a typical government, stupid, you know, one size fits none approach to everything they do. And uh, we're, we're seeing it. But if you look at the CDC said that 10 times as many people have uh, the virus as um, as or as have tested positive uh, or tested for um, for actually tested for antibodies, then you're looking at an IFR of an infection or infection fatality rate of about 0.1%, which brings into question why they're doing any of this stuff at all. But it was, you know, yeah, there, there is no question other than it was, a, first of all, it was a way to, for uh, politicians on the left to make life difficult for Trump. That's fine. I don't have any, uh, any, uh, any uh, interest in keeping Trump uh, in, in, in office. Uh, but now they've kind of, you know, it's, it's gotten ahead of them. You know, they, they have to believe their own phony narrative, which is that uh, uh, all of the shutdowns work. They don't. Uh, there's no empirical evidence whatsoever that the shutdowns have any effect whatsoever in stopping the spread of the virus. This is not a question that the virus uh, can be uh, lethal for people who have uh, uh, preconditions or have other, other comorbidities. Lockdowns that don't work. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to see. Yeah, see yeah, well, this. Sorry, go ahead. No, I also was going to point out that I mean, this whole first thing started. We were talking about three million deaths, and we ended up at three hundred thousand. And so, if, if we look at context, if we remember what we were afraid of at the beginning, we've it's, we're actually nowhere near that, and we've all forgotten that it was. We we're looking in the millions of dead at, when we started, and now we're in the hundreds of thousands, which is actually something we're competent to deal with. It, it's not something outside the range of things that human society has dealt with before. It's kind of... And that they're, they're saying that uh, um, that they're, they're looking at COVID and they're coming up with those number of deaths, not, not necessarily from, you know, people's blood that they're analyzing in hospitals, but they're looking at the number of excess deaths this year, which is at 15% over last year, and assuming that that's from COVID. 
So the problem with that is that they're discounting all the excess deaths associated with um, the lockdowns and much less the lives that are ruined forever. The business is gone. The, the transfer of, you know, that it, it's bad here, but in, in third world countries where people were teetering on the edge and relying on international commerce to trickle down some income for them, uh, it's even worse because uh, upwards of 150 million of those people are being pushed into the most extreme form of poverty by this and way more than 300,000 of them are going to die. So anyway, we beat this thing to death. It's, uh, it's a, a bad government policy that, you know, it's like the drug war. Once, once you get it started, you can't get off the bandwagon because how are you going to turn down all the money from the police unions and the correctional officers unions and all the lawyers? You, you just can't, you know, once you get used to spending that. It's kind of like asset forfeiture. Yeah, well, in San Francisco, they reported there's twice as many drug overdose deaths as COVID deaths. Um, I think suicides are up about twice. They've doubled. Suicides have doubled. So mm -hmm. that excess deaths is not all COVID deaths. Um, there was a story in uh, Politico this weekend or last week about why Democrats keep losing rural counties. How Democrats in this last election, they took a hammering outside of the central cities. And there's a reckoning, well, at least with some aspects of the Democrat Party, about how this is happening. And people are trying to come to grips with why this has exactly happened. And do you, know, you guys have any thoughts? Well, I have, yeah, I, I have a thought. I think the uh, difference between rural people, and I grew up rural, I grew up on a farm, and people who have never set foot on a farm, people who have lived in New York or San Francisco or LA or Chicago or whatever for you know their entire life, and the only view of a farm is looking out an airplane window. I think the difference is, is that people don't realize where their food is coming from. Uh, I remember an anecdote about somebody uh, Talking about uh, uh, you know being again or being in favor of shutting down the Central Valley in, in order to save the smell, saying I don't I'm not worried about where my food comes from, so I I just, I just go to Safeway. Uh, so you know there there's a, a lack of understanding about what where food comes from, where uh, you know how how the world actually works in terms of the food chain. That being the case. Farmers, they know where their food comes from. They know that they have to be out there working. They know that they have to uh, uh, sell into a, a market that is in large part controlled by, by monopolistic uh, organi organizations, which are protected. Their monopolies are protected, in, in effect, by the federal government. So uh, there's an awful lot of uh, uh, thought in rural counties that you know th things aren't right and the promises from the Democrats never come through. Let's give let's give the, the the Republicans a chance. That's that's where it's coming from. And I think I read that political that Politico article, James, and I think the the, the article missed the boat completely because they were the 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 person who was like first person self interview in the article. It's an op ed piece. Uh, was uh, on on the left and a progressive and talked about how, again, the things that Richard mentioned that, you know, the Dems makes promises and they show up for photo ops around election time, but the rest of the time they, they ignore the farmers. Actually, they don't ignore the farmers. What they do the rest of the time is support organizations and support policies and support regulations that make farmers' jobs harder and harder and harder and harder. And I don't know about Wisconsin, but I do know about California from talking to, to uh, a huge number of, of uh, ag business owners when I used to be uh, in development or fundraising. And, and they will flat out tell you that, you know, they now employ people full time, whereas it was a part time, a few hours a week job before. They employ a number of people if they have any size operation at all, two plus people to simply take care of the, the, the paper trail and the regulations. It's gotten so bad that, that if somebody wants to actually use a perfectly legal fertilizer, uh, a fertilizer they can buy at their local feed store, uh, and, and a different fertilizer than they're normally using, they have to fill out forms and get approval from the local regulatory, farm regulatory agency to actually use a different fertilizer. So on and on and on and on. And so the, the, the people on farms know flat out that the, the Dems are interested in, in environment first, food second, 
regulation first, commerce second, and that wasn't even mentioned in the article. And so uh, and they, I don't think there's any way for, for, for the Dems because they're not going to change their spots. They're not going to talk about less regulation. They're not going to get off their high horse about uh, environmental policies that are actually uh, destroying more animals than helping them out. Uh, it's a lost cause for them. There's nothing they can do. They can put people on the streets. They can have the president come and visit and everything else. But the reality is the Democratic Party is anti-farm, anti-farmer, anti-farm owner. And thinking that somehow farmers don't care about the land, this is their only asset that they're going to pass on to future generations to just sustain their wealth. Why would they not care about the land? Okay, I'm off that soapbox now. We can go on to something else. Well, I think from what I, my kind of perspective is, it's as much a cultural attitude as anything else. If you listen to the city people talk about the culture of the rural, of rural people, it's essentially hate speech. And mm -hmm. and if you don't They're think stupid. that they hear you, They're if you don't hear them. Because they, yeah. they vote for Trump. They're stupid. Well, it's flyover country. Trump. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's flyover country and, you know, people get tired of being thought of as flyover country. But going back to hate speech, the suppression of hate speech has driven more and more users off social media onto different platforms. Yeah. You've got you've got the, I went parlor minds, me, we there's locals. There's all kinds of new, new uh, social platforms. And I guess they're starting to gain strength. I think me, we hit what, nine million people now. So there's there's actually starting to hit a. Uh, a critical mass where they can actually may have some hope of a you know actual competition. Well, that's good and bad. It's good in the sense that uh, competition is always good. It's bad that the uh, competition is in, in in essence forced by the government by essentially blackmailing the Facebooks and Twitters and Googles of the world to say you either censor according to our dictates or we'll regulate the hell out of you. That's what's mm -hmm. happening. Uh, and uh, it's it's bad that uh, in the sense that uh, this will provide even more impetus to repeal Section 230, which is the regulation that, that prevents the government from uh, imposing, uh, from treating uh, uh, platforms as publishers. In other words, uh, if a platform is uh, liable for the, whatever scurrilous thing uh, a user says, they're they're you know they're in essence going to be required to self censor uh, to the extent that the the platform becomes simply another plain vanilla ABC CBS or NBC. That's what the politicians want. They want a media that will that they can, that's as malleable that they can control. Uh, for a while, the internet was something other than that. Uh, they're 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 reining it in. Uh, I, I wish Parler and the rest as uh, much luck as they deserve, but I'm sure that they will eventually follow or be, be required to uh, knuckle under to the same political pressures as the Giants are now. I want to add something to what Richard said, and that's uh, that, that, that there's the, the rise of these alternative platforms uh, uh, just happens to be happening at a time where uh, these these media platforms are saying yes we need censor we need government regulation we need regulation so what will what normally happens then when when the mass of people who who have the biggest dogs in the fight start facing competition they turn to the government to regulate them uh, in in with the phony promise that this is going to make for a a less biased less hate-filled speech platform. And what will happen is that uh, the, the regulations will end up favoring the existing platforms and preventing new platforms for starting because they won't have the resources to do the self-censoring. I'm going to call it self-censoring, basically what it is. That was supposed to be air quotes, but I didn't get my fingers on the screen. Um, what it is is... is uh, uh, mind speak. What it is 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 just lamestream media. Only instead of on a TV, it's it's or a radio. It's it's on your laptop. So this is going to benefit the big boys and keep the the little guys from being able to compete. That's the way it always works. And it will quell any kind of dissent to the official government line, uh, whether it's Democrat or Republican. It doesn't make any difference. Whoever's in power will control what's said on the media uh, implicitly. 
Well, all that, all the free airtime and all the free media that the political parties get, it gets paid back. That's, <laughs> it simply does. The host, speaking of New York of uh, media, the host of a, the Daily Clouds, New York Times, they got a Pulitzer Prize. I guess they had to turn it back in because they really butchered this cell fate thing. I only caught part of it. And so did you guys, any of you guys catch one of this thing? The New York Times had to do this big mea culpa. The, the caliphate, the, yeah. uh, the New York Times was was guilty of not not uh, uh, following the, the simple rules of uh, of journalists. They didn't check their source. This uh, this fella in Canada made up this story about being an ISIS uh, uh, hitman, executioner for ISIS, and and uh, the they um, there's lots of back scratching going on. The people in the show and all the rest of that. Uh, they didn't bother to check, and then instead of uh, doing a complete re retraction, they just said, well, only part of it's wrong, but the show is. And, and so it's the typical, the great lady, you know, used to be uh, known for wonderful journalism, and now, you know, she's, uh, her clothes are tattered, and she's doing a bad job as well. So the, the, the whole, 80% of the show was made up of whole cloth by this one guy who claimed to be an ISIS uh, uh, hit man turned out he'd never belonged to ISIS, never went to the places that he said he did, and apparently the Canadian government is prosecuting for lying about being a terrorist, which is weird. Um, <laughs> again, just, you know, just uh, bad journalism, as we're seeing everywhere and more and more. Well, you can be biased without being unethical. I, I You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with expressing your bias, expressing mm -hmm. your perspective. But you should be able to do it with ethics, especially if you're going to sit around and say that you're a journalist and you're the highest ethics of journalism. There's, you, you know, there should be some realism in there somewhere. Yeah, and I'd like well, to see. Well, there, there's, there's two problems here. One is ethics and one is uh, laziness. The first problem mm -hmm. was laziness. They didn't check their sources. That's, you know, real uh, simple rule number one in journalism. Make sure you check your sources and get verification from multiple uh multiple sources before you run with the story. And the second thing they did is once they once their error, their laziness was caught out, then they, they tried to, you know, cover their tracks in a very unethical way. All right, well, we got a few seconds left. I want to wish everybody a happy new year. I think, you know, it's been a tough 2020, man. I think 2021, we have a lot to look forward to. I want to thank everybody at Access Sacramento. I want to thank John and Richard, for continuing the Libertarian Counterpoint this year, it was a kind of, we've faced some challenges, but we've managed to get through. And I want to thank everybody for watching. And from those of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, thanks and good night. Happy New Year. Happy New Year and thank you all. I appreciate the work that you, you guys have been doing, yeoman's work. And please, appreciate with that thing, please remember to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.